There we go. And I'm going to remove my glasses. Since I don't have to read anything or see anything. Um, and it's nice to have you all here. So let me say the opening prayer and we'll get this show on the road. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we give thanks for the ability to, to, um, for us all to get together in this evening to ask information and receive information from Spirit. We ask your blessings on this gathering, wherever people may be, and we give thanks for the information that we will receive in this evening. We surround ourselves with the white light of truth. Nothing but that which is of the truth or for our good shall approach us. For we are children of God, and he will protect us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, it's not in evil. Just a moment, please, while I get your healings for all of you. And remember, while you are with us during this part, during this uh, question session, um, that you can ask your healer to send healing to anybody that you wish that you know of in need of healing as well as yourself. So one moment, please. Okay, I'm back, and now I'm going to get round card for you all. I hope you have, I hope you have, um, enjoy your evening, and I will be talking to you at the end of the session. Good evening. It is I, Ron Carr. It is my pleasure to be with you in this evening. You all have had a very busy weekend. Well, not you personally, perhaps, but in your country, in the United States, there have been many things going on. Many people proclaiming that what they are doing is caring about other people. And that is the reason they are present. That is why they are having their protest. That is why things are going on. Unfortunately, there are people within that group who are not there to protest, and they are not there to care about other people. They are there for other reasons which are their own. And so they destroy the unity that you try to project. And so how do you, in your own way, take care of other people? How do you show your concern? It is probably impossible for you to show your concern to anyone that matters. For it is such an emotional time for, uh, due to the behavior of other people that it is difficult for you to, be, to make an impression. You must remember that any change in the world starts with you personally, you personally, and what you do in your life can make a bigger change in the world than those who are out in the streets protesting or causing mayhem in the name of protesting. And so how do you start this in your life? Well, it's by being clear in your own ethics and what you want and what you desire for the world. 
it is my assumption that everyone who is present on this call desires peace and harmony throughout the world and truly could not see how any activities such as happened over this past weekend would cause peace and harmony. These were the actions of people not seeking to bring about peace and harmony. But what is it you need to do in your life to start the peace and harmony ball rolling, so to speak? And as I have said, it is for you to be clear on what you wish to achieve. That you know your own ethics and what you believe. Now, many times people have beliefs or think they have beliefs that point in one direction and uh, they think they are walking this line of their own beliefs. But in truth, they are sometimes allowing themselves to not be the ethical person they believe themselves to be because they will tend to change. Due to circumstances, they will change their mind. Such as, and there is no one on this program tonight who would think this, but this is an example, that you do not believe in capital punishment. You do not believe that anyone should be put to death over anything that they have done. But from time to time, you may find a heinous crime that bothers you so much, you would find it very difficult to stick to that idea, that thought, that everyone should have the, the uh, not be put to death. There are those who think that they would like to see the freedom of action for everyone in the country all the time, but when they're confronted with the disturbances that are proclaimed to be peaceful demonstrations or protestations, they find it difficult to not be angry over the situation because they are themselves frustrated by the behavior of others. When you know what you want and you know the way you would like the world to be, you need to always apply your expectations that you have of others to yourself. If you expect other people to apologize to you, Find the ways and notice the times that it is important for you to apologize to others. If you should happen to miss your, your ethics or fall from your level of standards, it is not for you to berate yourself, but to note that you didn't live up to your own idea and to determine that in the future you will try to be more universal in your application of your own ideas. It is said, whatever you wish to be done to yourself, you should do unto others. It is a very profound statement. How do you like to be treated? Do you want people to treat you honestly? Then you must treat others honestly. Do you want people to listen to your words? then you need to listen to the words and ideas of others. If you want people to, as I have said, apologize, then you must be ready to make apologies should you uh, cause problems for someone else when you can really recognize that. And especially if you knew or know that you could have avoided your, those actions and you could have done better. Of course, if it is someone of great significance to yourself, no matter how you feel about it, it's often best to apologize for your actions, your behaviors, um, even though you might not determine it was your fault. It is still a wise thing to apologize because it starts an open dialogue, perhaps, so that you can truly learn to know more about one another and understand those people who are important to yourself. And so you should always treat people just the way you want to be treated. And that is such an immense statement. 
it is such an, a demanding thing for you to place upon yourself to treat others the way you want to be treated. But it makes a simple rule of behavior. And if you practice that rule of behavior, you will tend to create peace and harmony in your life because you simply need to look to yourself and say, do I like this? Would I want this? If, would I like to experience this? And of course, if the answer is no, then it's how can you not do this to someone else? And so I simply ask you in this evening to think about your own morals and your own guidance to try to set your own standards of behavior for yourself. Being loving is understanding other people, accepting them as you, they are. So if you wish to be loving, accept people as they are with all their faults and all their warts, because you would like to be accepted for that. People sometimes know that they are imperfect, but yet they do not see their faults. So if you are aware that you too are imperfect, be willing to look at how other people react to the things that you say and do in case these are your faults that can become obvious if you pay attention to the actions of others. If people react badly to the things that you say, perhaps you are not using enough thought in your words. And so to create peace and harmony across the face of the earth is to create peace and harmony within your own life. And as you are peaceful, as you are in harmony with others, so it is that you will experience, um, you will create peace and harmony in someone else's life. I like for everyone to try to create joy within their own lives and enjoying a life that is filled with peace and harmony is part of joy. And I would wish for you all that you create success and prosperity in your life for a life filled with success, prosperity, peace and harmony is wonderful to live. And of course, I would wish for you all that you have self-fulfillment, that you do the things that make you feel good. And there again, when you have self-fulfillment and you are creating success and prosperity and your life is peaceful and harmonious, are you not living a joyful life? And then all it takes is for you to recognize the good that is in your life, to create happiness. For happiness is the active appreciation of life, meaning you look in all directions, you look about you, you see what is there, and you appreciate and love every beautiful day. You appreciate and love the rain. You appreciate and love your relationships you have with others. You appreciate and love your opportunities for employment, for success and prosperity. And when you put them all together, you live a joyful life. And if everyone lives their own joyful life, personifying love, peace, and harmony in themselves. And there will be no reason for others to decide to protest or to cause mayhem. And they will be defeated. You will be the winner because you will enjoy a joyful, happy life. Now, are there any questions that anyone would like to ask me, either on the topic that I have chosen to talk about or your own topics? Please unmute yourself 
and ask away. Well, I sometimes find this happens. Norma? Maybe, perhaps a bit. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, someone is speaking. Yeah, Ranga, this is Mahesh. Ah, oh, Mahesh. How nice, nice to see you, to be with you. Nice, yeah, nice to be with you. Uh, I had a question on the same topic. I was reading a book, uh, Conversation with God. And in that book, uh, God says, all are beautiful angels, everyone. They are all beautiful little small angels. And one angel wants to become a king on the earth, like he wants to come to the earth and become, well, he wants to become a king. Now, if somebody, if, if, if a, uh, a soul or an angel <clears throat> want to experience the life of a king, then there has to be some souls, some angels who would, who would volunteer to become uh, the servants, the butlers, like, you know, the, every king should have uh, servants and butlers. So if you, few uh, angels come forward and they volunteer to become the king's uh, butler or the king's servants. My English is not very good, but I'm just trying to express. Yes. So that and is- so What is your question? Is the, yeah, that is the drama that is uh, behind the scene, like uh, behind the being king and uh, being the butlers, being the servants. Now, same way, <clears throat> suppose there are four persons in, involved here. There are four angels, or four persons, angel, uh, uh, four angels involved here. One about this uh, instance in the uh, New York Central Park. Uh, there is a woman, white woman, and a, and a guy, black guy. Uh, and here, in this case, uh, Mr. Floyd and uh, the police officer. Now, I would treat that they are also all four angels. And uh, they had a purpose <clears throat> to bring awareness about this life, all, all life matters, every, every, all life matters, not the irrespective of the skin color and irrespective of whether a life is a human life or a life of a tree or life of an animal, every life is important. And if they want to bring the awareness, they have to play the role of a victim and the perpetrator. So victim is that uh, guy and the perpetrator is, uh, looks like that white woman who called the police saying that one uh, uh, African-American wants to, uh, is running her life. And in the second instance, uh, this guy, Mr. Floyd and the police officer, uh, is this a role playing uh, that is happening here to bring the awareness about the life, the importance of life? So I believe your question really is what has happened. Um, Behind the scenes. Yes. Were, the, were these people um, playing the role that they came to play? Is yes, that your question? to bring the awareness. Yeah, to bring the awareness. Now to the, bring the awareness. Yeah, I have one more. Uh, want to, I want to add something more. The apparent uh, victim and the apparent perpetrator. Now if we take the victim, the victim has died, and the perpetrator will also sacrifice. He will be in jail for a long time. And in, in the second instance, the perpetrator, her career has been torn apart. Her career, the woman's career has been torn apart. So all are victim here. There is no perpetrator. Uh, all are victim here. So all these people, they wanted to bring the awareness on the planet Earth or what is going on. <clears throat> so your question truly is, is just the, the last question you have asked. Of all these people and what they have experienced, was it their desire to bring an awareness yes, to this yes. that was going on? Now, usually when you incarnate into a life, you do not plan the life in such detail that you will um, be acting as you plan. And there is an additional um, caveat, which means um, warning, that um, when you, even if you have determined to act in a certain way, when you come into the earth plane as an infant, the awareness of what you came for and what you choose to do is somewhat erased. 
it is there, but it is begins to be buried within all the sense impressions that come with physical body. And so physical body obscures much of what you may have desired to do or perform when you enter into the, into the earth plane. And so I would not say for sure that these individuals, the, the gentleman who was uh, murdered by the policeman or the policeman himself, came with that specific purpose in mind to make others aware. Because the truth of the matter is that they did not um, truly make people aware. People were already aware of how they should, how policemen should treat the criminals. And most policemen behave in the ways that they are taught to behave and not cause the death of others unnecessarily. I know there have been many who have uh, murdered someone who was in, in, innocent, but uh, most of those would be considered to be mistakes. They were not malicious. This particular action seemed to be more malicious and uh, probably was the result of difficulties that the policeman was having himself in many ways. And so he was not perhaps acting maliciously toward the, uh, to, toward the gentleman who was uh, murdered, but was simply uh, reacting to other things in his life, which caused him to be insensitive to the situation. And that is not to excuse his behavior. It is just merely to say this was not his intent. Now, there is an understanding that for every pain that you, in, uh, that you receive from others, the others are as much involved in the situation as you yourself are that for every good thing or every bad thing that happens from someone else, the, that both are playing, the, uh, performing the play, which is what you are speaking about here. If this policeman came specifically to murder this specific man um, so that they could bring awareness to others, it wasn't a very good plan because to be honest, all that has successfully happened is that people have become divided and not a great deal of harmony has ensued from the situation. And so there was, if this was their planning, it was very poorly planned. And I will say that when you are in spirit, you usually have a lot more common sense than to plan any such actions. Usually what has happened is that the individual soul, upon incarnating, chose an incarnation which was a challenge to himself to demonstrate his virtue and his abilities. But the issues of the physical life are so overshadowing of intentions, and even knowledge that is fully known and understood in spirit is obscured and often is not um, it does not come forth into the life uh, experience of any individual. Frequently, you simply react to situations um, without moving inside yourself to find out what is the best way to react, what or how to handle this situation. You are so engaged in the physical that there is like a shortcut in your brain which goes from this happened to me or this person said this and I react. I don't think about it beforehand. I do not stop and say, how do I want to rehandle this situation? If someone hurts me, hits me, perhaps all I do as, as a male would be to turn around and punch him right back. 
Is that how you want to handle the situation? Is that likely to end it? Is that likely to be a good situation that you were creating when you react to what someone says or does? So what I am trying to convey is that most people on the physical plane are not necessarily performing with any such mission that they have come. The ones who live the best lives are the ones who are performing their mission. They have de determined that they want to do thus and so. And they are determined that they will be successful. And while they may not remember this determination, it is possible that they always have this desire to be a, a film actor, that to be a musician, to be an artist, to be a policeman, to be an engineer, to be a businessman, to be successful. And that is what drives them to making their decisions. And when they make decisions that both bring about happiness in their lives and self-fulfillment, then they are manifesting the reason they came into this incarnation. Because that is the ultimate goal of every incarnation or how to judge an incarnation. If you have created in such a way, even though part of your life may have been spent doing things that you did not like to do, but they were what you chose to do because it helped you reach the goal. By the time they reach a person of your age or somewhat older before they transition again into spirit, if they are experiencing joy and peace and harmony in their lives, they have led a very good incarnation and this is what they have come for to manifest. Along the way, in order to experience success and prosperity, you had to give things to other people that help these other people enjoy their lives because that is how peaceful, how, how people become successful. They simply do things that other people seek, want, or desire. And so they are successful in their work. If they enjoy it as they are doing it, so much the better. They are even more successful. So when we come back to the premise of your original question, did these individuals come here to create this specific incident? I would venture to say absolutely not. They had other intentions in mind. And in the case of the person who was murdered, that he, he had lost his way from his intentions. And he was not doing things which would bring about his greatest good, his happiness, his joy. They were, he was doing other things for certainly if he had been understanding, had listened to the policeman, had not resisted arrest, it would have been a different situation than manifesting. So he was unhappy. Obviously, the policeman was unhappy because he was unnecessarily rough and very nasty and not nice to this person and did not care at all what he did to him. So where was he wrong? These were not desired objectives deliberately came forth in the life. Those who have goals to bring about awareness usually seek to teach. People like Dr. Martin Luther King, who allowed, after teaching and proclaiming peace and uh, but working steadfastly to bring about civil rights to his people, that he was still assassinated and murdered because he was working for a true cause. That brings about much greater awareness within the world. 
than the actions of this policeman and this man or anyone else in the mobs or the other people that were killed. This was not beneficial for any of those things. Is that, do you understand my answer? Yes, I do understand. And thank you very much for the time. You are most welcome. Does anyone have other questions? Hi, um, my name is Marta. I have a question um, about my personal life. Um, so specifically my love life, I'm seeing uh, a man named Dan, uh, Dan and um, I just wanted to know if this is a good relationship for me and if it's going to lead to marriage. So Martha, you are asking me a personal question. I usually try to avoid speaking on such personal issues since I am speaking to many people and many other people will be looking over this, this video as it is posted. So you must be aware that um, many people will be listening to my answer as well as your question. Um, and perhaps you would prefer that it isn't answered. And so I do not tend to say things like, yes, you and his name was Dan, correct? Yes. Yes, that you and Dan will have a wonderful life together. It is a good relationship and it will go on. I will not give you that answer, but I will ask you some questions about yourself, which you do not need to answer for me, or I will give you some thoughts that you need to think about. Now, you are obviously enjoying your relationship with Dan and your question would indicate that you would like this relationship to continue. And so we will assume that this is a fulfilling relationship for yourself. And um, of course, then the answer is, is it also fulfilling for him? We will assume that it is fulfilling for him also, and he would like to see this relationship continue. That is all that you need to think about or worry about, is whether I am being the best person in this relationship with him. Am I placing expectations upon what I think he is like, how he will behave in circumstances, whether he is a good prospect for myself? These are things, your expectations on someone are the most important reason as to whether a marriage or a relationship will be successful or unsuccessful. So how are you judging him? Now at the moment you obviously see good things in him. There are things that you like and those things may be there truly present, but you cannot base your life upon the fact that what you believe you see is the truth because it could prove to be different. But then you need to ask yourself the questions along the line of, is he ethical? Does he have a good set of standards that are similar to your own standards? Do you have similar ideas about things? Because it helps when you are with someone um, to be in marriage and a rela deep relationship of any kind that you have similar standards and similar ideas of what you wish to achieve and where you want to go. And they tell you that um, you should ask such questions of, do you want children uh, so that you are in agreement of this? Do you, uh, do you personally expect to keep working forever and ever? Um, or are you thinking that you will have a child and stop working? This is an important issue that at some point in time may be negotiated between you and uh, Dan. And so it is really, really important to look at these things. Now, sometimes, particularly when you are falling in love, when you see someone that you think is perfect in every way, and you love the way they talk and the way they act and their ideas and how they think, and you see so many good things about this individual. Um, you, this is what you have to be, become aware of whether you are not seeing other things, which may be an indication that you will have difficulty 
So that comes down to what are you expecting of him? If you have expectations and he does not fulfill those expectations, you will be disappointed. And when you are disappointed, will that spoil your relationship? Or will you merely be able to say, that's okay because he is wonderful in this other way. And not everybody can be everything. Everybody is human, a little bit imperfect in some way or another. And because you were raised in different families and in different regions and in different ways, they're coming from different backgrounds, there are things that will be different about you. Is that okay with you that he doesn't agree with the same sort of things that you want? So when you ask about your relationship with Diane, I can tell you that you are, you are experienced, experiencing a great attraction to him. And before you make any decisions uh, on the relationship, let it continue a while longer to see how it continues to go. And if it continues and you can only become happier with him and more joyful and you find more things that you can share, then you can with confidence know that it will be a successful relationship. And one way of showing love for a person is to accept them as they are. When you become critical of how they think, how they act, what they wear, how they speak, anything you become critical of, you are showing uh, displeasure at that aspect of someone. And if you want him to love you, you need to accept him as he is and just love him and that's what love means accepting someone as they are and wishing the best for themselves and if you find that he is always wishing the best for you that when you make a faux pas and you do something that he doesn't like can he forgive you can you keep going can you forgive him these are all necessary for a wonderful relationship your relationship has great potential but it is up to you to make it work. Not you specifically, but you in the plural, where both of you need to love and accept one another. I hope that's helpful for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Ron Carr, this is Tanya. Uh, can you take oh. another question or are you still? Yes, of course. Um, I loved her question and it made me wonder when a couple has been together for 30 or 40 or 50 years and they know so much about each other, they've lived together, they become perhaps bored of one another, that new, fresh, lively feeling may have waned. Is there a reason for that? And how do you um, help with that so that it stays live and fresh and fun 50 years later? Does that make sense? Yes, of course. But I will tell you that if you have been in a relationship for 50 years, neither of you is very fresh. <laughs> neither of you is very lively. And so just having right. things in a calm way. Now, it is very possible in these long-term relationships, you, could, you don't have as much to talk about and you're watching TV a lot together. Does it mean something is wrong? because you're not speaking a lot. It may be that you have gotten to know someone another, one another so well that you um, simply know that, oh, it's time for me to go to bed. He's tired too. We're both going to bed now. It does not matter what's happening. Lively and fresh has a lot to be desired. What you truly enjoy after you've been married for a long time is simply the comfortableness of an old shoe, so to speak. The person you're with, hopefully, is very comfortable with you and you are comfortable with them. We, you know how one another is likely to react. You know their likes, their dislikes, 
why do you need to have new and fresh and enthusiasm? Because what you truly want most of the time is to know how things are going to go. Fresh, exciting, always has a little bit of danger in it, or uncertainty, or unknowledge, no knowledge. And so that keeps things exciting. But after a long number of years it, in a relationship, it is nice to someone who is predictable, who understands that when you're tired, perhaps you don't talk very much. If you're upset over something, maybe you are the kind of person who has to talk it all out. And whatever has happened, and it's probably after 30 years, it's probably something that's happened with the neighbors or the children or other family members that you need to talk about. In which case, you need to express yourself and you expect sympathy, understanding from the other person. So when you are talking about keeping a relationship fresh, a truly good relationship, does not look to be exciting or fresh. Sometimes comfortable is the one that you most desire to have. It makes life extremely safe and livable. And uncertainty is not what you want in your life. Do you desire uncertainty in your life? You need not answer that question. I know you would rather be certain that you have enough money that you have someone who will stand beside you and behind you and help you rather than be in doubt. And that's what you get when you are experiencing something new and exciting. So I think my answer to your question is after 30 or 40 years, most people do not look for new and exciting. They like the old comfortable shoe and the comfortable blankets and the armchair that is comfortable, which means the older person you've already been with and developed a good relationship with is the best one for you. No changes. I'm speechless, thank you. I, I have no words, I um, thank you. You are most welcome. It is my pleasure to have answered your question. Are there other questions? Hi, Ronkar. I had a question. Yes. Um, I was wondering about um, my career. I guess I'm kind of at a point where I'm considering a big pivot and um, I've been, you know, trying to kind of uh, channel with my loved ones in spirit and I just keep feeling very conflicted. So I was looking for a little insight on that. So you say you are about to pivot. Your Possibly. Career. Yes. Possibly. Because and my interpretation of the way you have phrased this, since you have not chosen to tell me what you're pivoting from to, um, which is acceptable, um, is that, okay, how to answer that question? Because I do, as, as I indicated to, to Marta, that I do not like to speak in specifics at these types of meetings. Um, but to give you the kind of advice that you need to be able to be independent and make your own decisions. And you say that there is conflict. So obviously, what is happening to you is in your current career, you experience some satisfaction. Um, and self-satisfaction is really important in your life because you can have not as much money as others, but if you enjoy what you're doing, that is very important. You take a great deal of satisfaction. Your job will not have as much stress. And then of course, the pivot would indicate something is changing. Now, you find that, do you? This is a question to ask yourself, and you probably have been not asking the question, but experiencing it. Does this pivot, sound exciting to yourself? Is it pivoting into a direction that you would prefer or is it just a different direction? And why are you thinking about leaving your current position? I am quite aware that within the world as it works today, 
that career changes are normal and natural, different than it was a century ago or 70 or 80 years ago. Um, when a young man went to work, he w would often be in the same job for the rest of his life and retire from the company and that was considered a good life. But now you consider having multiple careers um, and each career would fulfill perhaps a different level of yourself because there are levels within yourself of things that you like to do. So sometimes something is more creative than the current job you have. And if you do not have the ability to create, you may want to, to express that part of yourself. And so that new job may be very exciting to contemplate. Maybe it'll bring you another level of responsibility. How are you going to react to more responsibility? Are you going to enjoy it? Think you're going to step up to it, be able to take charge and, and, and do it? Um, this can be intimidating to contemplate and perhaps this is a situation for yourself. The pivot may be into um, a different field, uh, but more responsibility or maybe staying in the same field, but now you're going to do a different angle on your job, a different level of responsibility, have different um, things that you must do. Response, I keep using responsibility, I'm sorry, I'm not thinking of other words, bringing other words to you, but that's really what it matters, is, is what you are doing and how, if this is what you think you desire. So I really can't help you and tell you, oh yes, go ahead and pivot. Or no, you'll be much more happier in your own job. You have to think about this new job. And I know you have said to me that you find it exciting. That means you are looking at something that is challenging for yourself. And this is what you are excited about that you could be learning a lot, you would be stepping up, you would earn more money. It is such an interesting thought. And then you can look at your current job. And perhaps it is an old shoe for you, that it is comfortable, you can do it, but look to your future. Do you want to continue to do it? I suspect you are young and you would like to have a greater challenge manifesting in your life. Um, not really, I'm sorry, that was poorly phrased. You are not looking for a greater challenge. You are not necessarily looking for the challenge, but an opportunity to grow and become more than you are today. That is a valid reason for taking such an opportunity. And of course, there is risk. What if you don't like it after all? What if it doesn't work out for yourself or they do not like you? But it is all a learning experience, and you must know that you will gain from the experience, even if it does not work out to the possible advantage that you are considering. You will gain, you will get knowledge, you will know more about yourself. And so it is frequently a good thing to accept the challenge of a pivot in your life, especially if you can see the good of making that pivot. So I think that answers your question, yes? Yes, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Are there other questions for me? Hello. Yes, I, this is Donna. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I, I was just wondering if you could explain that. You, you were talking before about falling in love and it occurred to me that love is the word we're used to say that we should love everybody, you know, love everybody equally, etc. So can you explain a difference between the falling in love and loving everybody, if there is a difference? And the other thing was, do we take both those things with us into spirit or is one of them just on the earth plane? 
I suspect both of them are just on the earth plane when you are in spirit. Let us first define love. Truly what love is, is seeing the good in someone else and accepting them as they are. They're the two components for loving someone. So that you have a child and you love that child. You love that child for several reasons. One is a partially or she is partially a reflection of yourself, your upbringing, your mate. Um, and so that child has, is inherently lovable from, from the time he is born for most people. And, um, and as a parent, you try to shape him, you try to guide him, you do what you need to do and of course, sometimes the child um, goes his own way with his own determination. And you sometimes wonder how you ever, um, this was your child. Um, <laughs> because he is whatever he is or she is whatever she is. And that bears no resemblance to you, your spouse, or what you have done. But it does not matter. You still love them because you accept them. So that is the other aspect of being loved and loving people. You accept them as they are. So when you fall in love, usually that involves a rush of emotions and hormones, remembering that the hormone system in the body determines many emotions that you experience. And so you uh, determine that this person is really good. They are wonderful. Um, and you are amazed and you see all this beauty in them and you fall in love and you want to be with them all the time and you want them in your life and you want to, uh, you are excited and you only see what you like about them and you do not see what the ways in which they may be disappointing to yourself. And so they fall in love. That's falling in love. But love is that loving someone is that sustaining relationship in which you continue to see the good, accept the things that you may not like about the person for what they are, allow them to be as they are. In other words, not completely, not complaining and being unhappy that they are the way they are because that causes your own unhappiness and will, I will promise you will be the end of the relationship but to accept them as they are, even when you find them um, less than you would want them to be in some areas. But you fell in love with certain things and you have to remember what you fell in love with. So when you love something, um, that is accepting it as it is and continuing to uh, wish for the good of, for that individual when you love someone. And when you love others in the world, it is a bit nebulous in the sense that you wish everyone in the world to have a peaceful, harmonious life. You wish them all to be prosperous. You wish that they all have good relationships. That is being loving toward the, the world and how you would like it to be. And you yourself try to be the best person that you want to be that you practice um, being loving and accepting and giving of others. You are generous with what your uh, thoughts are and your wants and desires for others. You wish other people well. And that is loving uh, in the general sense of the world. So when you get into spirit, we do not have emotions because we do not have physical bodies and we do not have hormones. So therefore we do not experience emotions, but we exist in a state um, that is, can, well, I like the word euphoria. However, that might be an overstatement, but there is a contentment um, with the, the way that you are when you are in spirit. There is nothing to be disappointed about. Everything is fine. 
everything is good. You can choose to learn things, you can choose to see things, you can choose to read the Akashic records. You can simply be in the state of bliss because you are one with God and one with this creation. And you know yourself to be good and you know all those others who are in spirit to be good also and to be all part of God's plan. We are all one. And when you are in spirit, you're conscious of that oneness you have with one another, but you are also aware of yourself as an individual. So it is such a different state of being that it, I would say that we do not have love in the spirit world, but then at the same time, we are existing in total love, peace, and harmony. Are there any other questions? Okay, so if you go into your mind to find a spot where there is love, would that kind of be the same spot that you not necessarily call it love, but perfect happiness? Yes, you could um, do that and compare that to being in spirit, yes. When you are in meditation, uh, many people meditate on being one with God and that euphoric, they enjoy a slightly euphoric state while they are meditating because they are experiencing only peace and harmony with their oneness with God when they do that. So that is of the closest I can come to describing um, what it's like to be in spirit. Okay, that was awesome, thank you. You are most welcome. Are there other questions? Hi, this is Elizabeth. A few weeks ago, you had given me the name of a guardian angel. I was wondering, are they related to us or were they from our past lives or are they just appointed to us? They are not appointed to you in that sense. It is usually agreed upon before you enter into the incarnation. They could have been part of family members or friends or lovers, spouses. They could have had any relationship to you from a previous incarnation. So very often these individuals um, are family members and friends from previous incarnations. And there are reasons why they choose to be with you while you are in this life, in this incarnation for the relationships you have had in the past, which uh, bring to themselves and to you satisfaction and helping one another. Everyone seeks to be of service. And I have often said to those who have listened before, when you are in spirit, you cannot create. The way that we would like to be most like our creator is him as creator, and you cannot create. So therefore, you um, seek to incarnate because on the physical world, you become a creator. Literally in every day, you create the life that you live. And so it is, um, it is why we incarnate. And also many of us incarnate to serve. You want to bring a message forth, such as what Ms. Hesh was asking about in the beginning. You want to make people aware of something. Well, then you will dedicate your life to that. You will not just give it up and say, this is going to make people aware. You will dedicate to the best of your ability, bringing that awareness to other people. Um, and uh, you wish to be a lover. And so you seek to love others and spread love throughout the world through your own words, through your own family, through your own actions. You know, in, in the times past, families tended to be large. People had many children and many grandchildren. And as they aged, they were the pivot of love within the family. They loved their children. They loved their grandchildren. They would be of great stability within their families. And that was what they desired to do. So yes, our guardian angels, your guides, your guardian angels are often people that have been with you in the past. And if you wish to know, try asking your guardian, 
your your guide how what the relationship was that you had with one another so that and and just listen and wait and perhaps you will know uh, receive the information when you ask it and you desire it and you go inside to look for it you'll have your own conclusions about why and what and how thank you so much you're welcome are there other questions uh, when you, you're in spirit, you were saying you, you, you can't create. I know you can't create physically, obviously, but what about thoughts and ideas? You can have thoughts and ideas, um, but since you generally have a great deal more knowledge in spirit than when you were on the physical plane, um, it, these thoughts and ideas are more like knowledge than they are as something new that is happening or going, um, but you are not creating them. On the physical plane, when you have a thought or an idea, you can bring it into manifestation. On the, in the spiritual plane, if you have a thought or an idea, you are simply going to have a thought or idea. I know it may not make sense, but, and you must create on the mental plane. But there is no, in, in, when you, uh, in an incarnation, you have a thought or idea. It starts your creation on the mental plane. You bring it into manifestation in reality on the physical plane. When you only are dealing with the mental, with the mental plane mostly, you, um, that is all there is. You cannot bring it into physicality. Right, but you're in the mental plane and you're thinking about coming here and creating a certain life or something. So, so isn't that technically a new idea? Yes, I guess you could call it technically a new idea, but it takes you getting into the physical plane to actually have the incarnation in order to do it. Yes, I understand that part. I was just wondering about your thought processes up there. You know, I, I mean you have everybody to contact with and everybody to talk to and uh, and if you decide to come back here it's ha isn't that like a creating an idea of what you want to do here what you want to be when you get here obviously you can't do it until you get here but just the ideas well you may consider that creating if you wish Okay. <laughs> but then you, it, it is, again, it, you are bringing this, you are doing something while you are in spirit that um, may be considered a creation. It, it simply is a matter of definition. And I do not consider having an idea um, or a desire to enter into the incarnation as being a creation. Oh, okay. It, it, it is it's a matter of semantics, if you wish. Okie dokie. <laughs> All right, well, I'll give you a break. <laughs> why, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions? Um, I have a dumb question. Who's the volunteer? And yeah, Norma got an email today from somebody. She just mentioned at dinner. And the subject of the email or an article was, was that um, if you grow your hair longer, you tend to be more psychic. What do you think about that? Ah, well, that is an interesting question. Um, does the length of the hair act as an antenna, is what you are asking me, uh, ask, act as an antenna for um, picking up psychic thoughts or awareness of psychic things? And to be honest, I have no um, experience or understanding of that particular philosophy on whether it acts. It's, it's okay. It's just a dumb question I thought I would ask. You are most welcome. It was a dumb question. I assume everyone heard that and he was just asking. I, I, um, 
I do not know uh, is the answer that I must give on that. Okay. Are there any other questions, dumb or otherwise? I have a question. Hi, it's Nancy. <clears throat> Nancy. Uh, how is it that if uh, people like Jesus and Martin Luther King <clears throat> and others, Abraham Lincoln perhaps, um, were high in their ideals and ethics and um, did not deviate from them and had a purpose and had a religious or a spiritual base, how is it that their, their demise, or let's say that when they laid the body aside, um, that it appeared to be by means of violence when they themselves were such nonviolent beings? Yes, that is an interesting question. Um, and one of the, I, I liked your use of the word appeared to be violent. And this is true. Um, one moment. By living a life of virtue and having as many people as you choose uh, or you can become aware of your virtues as an individual, um, you get suddenly terminated by the act of another. It often has more impact. Now, if you look at the recent situation over the the death of, I'm sorry, the name is, his name is not. Floyd, George Floyd. Yes, um, George Floyd. This individual was not particularly virtuous. However, his life, as his death, um, has stirred the conscience of many people. And so you might consider that a violent death, such as has been experienced by Jesus, by Dr. Martin Luther King, by Abraham Lincoln, that, and many others, that it was through their dying that the impact became known to very many people. And this has been true of many, many, many men and even women throughout the ages. You might look at uh, Joan of Arc, Jeanne d'Arc, that she had her ideas and she was in service to France and she was so put to death in such a horrible fashion. And why do you remember her? Because of her death. Um, this is unfortunately a way of making an impression upon others. And so when you come to serve others through idealistic means and actions, um, a violent death somewhat assures your demise, your transition as being noticed. Now, there are very many men and women who at wartime experienced untimely deaths and very violent ways. And these people were just as good as those that we have talked about in many ways. They were serving what they thought was the welfare of others. And so they allowed themselves to be involved in the war in ways that resulted in their demise and their transition. While they are not individually known, as a group, they are honored for the service they have given all men in uh, wartime and women uh, in later times or when women were fighting were honored for the service and for their deaths. 
So in individual families, individuals who are honored for their deaths within their own families. Maybe they are not known by the notion, by the uh, majority of people, not individually, but to those who knew them. Their service, their demise is important and meaningful and may even cause others to think and act differently, the same as the lives of Jesus the Christ and Dr. Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln may have affected larger numbers of people because they sought to uh, preach and to be made known about themselves to inspire uplift. But the demise of even, uh, as I have said, the soldiers and men and women who have served in the armies uh, sacrificed their lives for the welfare of others have always been honored by those who knew them. And so it is a matter of how many people were affected by your sacrifice or your living uh, to make the impression upon others. And Jesus the Christ, perhaps you may say, well, he really didn't affect that many people, but he affected someone by the name of Paul, who was once known as Saul, and they changed the name to indicate his change of, of um, consciousness. And Paul took lessons from the life of Jesus and went out to spread the word. Of course, he was later crucified himself, although you do not speak of him in the same way you speak of Jesus the Christ. But he went forth to spread the teachings of another and also met a rather horrific death. So you ask why? Well, it is one way to make an impression. And that is about the only thing I can say. People often do not pay attention to someone who lived a wonderful life. Uh, we will say in a mass area, um, there have been many people who contributed to the welfare, greater welfare of many thousands of people, but essentially, um, do I, I do not even say wish to go unheralded. For you can think of Gandhi, how, what he did for his country and what the message that he brought forth. And of course, he simply died, uh, a death that was not dramatic. So maybe people do not think of him in the same way as Jesus the Christ or Dr. Martin Luther King. So why do people have to suffer a violent death and that kind of a death? It's not that they have to suffer that death, but in order to make an impression that lasts and a bigger impression upon individuals, perhaps that is why they um, allow for that death um, to materialize for themselves or their words and actions, remembering that you almost always create your future for yourself. And so it was by living loudly by their ethics that they attracted to themselves the violent death. I hope that answers your question. Um, it's a good answer, um, and I think it's true. So it it almost runs counter to the law of attraction, except for the loudly part, um, because they, their high vibration through their lives and through their actions, you would think it would, it would call unto them peace and happiness and joy and not a apparently violent death. But I do accept, you know, your answer. I think it was a good answer. Yes, well, thank you. But you are assuming that they did not experience peace or happiness in their life. Mm -hmm. It is very possible, and I will tell you it is, 
by living and upholding their values and their ideas while there were stresses and difficulties for them all. To live by your highest self, doing what you believe to be the best, brings about its own internal satisfaction in your life. And for Dr. Martin Luther King, many people loved him for his actions. As much as he may have generated animosity among some because of his stands and his efforts that led to his death for himself, he took great satisfaction in living the life that he did, however stressful it may have been. And the same is true for Abraham Lincoln, and the same is true for Jesus the Christ. Thank so you so much. Assuming that the death negated a wonderful life is an error. Yes, yes. I don't think it negated their wonderful lives, but perhaps they were happy anyway. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. It was a wonderful answer. Thank you. You are most welcome. Are there any other questions? Yeah, uh, you mentioned Gandhi. Gandhi, Gandhi yes. Yeah, Gandhi, Gandhi was also killed. He was also killed. Yes, he was uh, also killed. He did was, not die a normal life. He was also killed. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I was not aware of how he passed. Yeah, he was killed. <clears throat> so it is the same. It is he the same. certainly uh, affected a large number of people not just within his own country, but outside of his country for his beliefs and his behaviors and living up to what he was seeking to do. So unfortunately, these type of people sometimes have a death that is uh, surprise, terminated, perhaps brutal. Um, but transition is what transition is. And the method of death does not disturb you very much when you uh, have trans completed your transition, it is immaterial. How much suffering may or may not have been there. Are there any other questions? Thank you. I thought Mother Teresa, did she die a violent death? No, I don't believe she did. I didn't think so either. Right, but um, she also affected many people. Not everyone has a violent death who has lived a wonderful life. And many people who have not lived a wonderful life still experience that violent death. But is the gunshot, which we consider to be a violent death, um, any more violent than, um, in a sense, the deterioration of the body over time because of an illness such as cancer? There was probably more suffering if you die slowly from cancer than if you die suddenly by a bullet, an assassin's bullet. That's for sure. I'd rather have the bullet. <laughs> yes. Are there any other questions? I think we have gotten toward the end of our evening and it's time for me to say good night. So this is the last call. Speak up. So no one has another question. So therefore, I give you all my blessings. Good night. Good night. Good night, Julia. Good night.